Praise the Lord. I'm glad to see a lot of people here. Glad it turned out well for Southwest Radio. I've been friends uh, with their ministry for years. I want you to take a good look at me because I'll be the reason why you're late for lunch. <laughs> and if you uh, signed up for the VIP lunch, you'll be the reason why I won't eat. So anyway, I'm looking forward to it. Uh, did you bring a Bible? It's a Bible prophecy conference, right? Sure, word of prophecy deal, you know, that all that stuff. Uh, if you did, uh, let me do this. Uh, let me get my bearing straight here. There we go. Turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 11. Uh, most of the verses I'll put up on the screen for you because I want to try to move through fast. And uh, I promise you that I will not get done with this presentation, but that's okay. Uh, whatever is not done here is already on the DVDs, uh, as he mentioned. I do actually have a website called ufopastor.com. And yeah, I, I was surprised because just, it just hit me one day. I want a place to put all my UFO videos. And so I thought, what will I call it? And so I went to Google and typed that in, and nobody had ever thought of it before, so I bought it right then and there. And um, uh, so anyway, it's, uh, we use it. He's not kidding. We have been to uh, three MUFON conventions, Mutual UFO Network conventions. Uh, the first one was in Lost Wages, Nevada, and uh, that was an interesting place. Yeah. Uh, then uh, the next one was in Denver, Colorado, where you're guaranteed to step on somebody's feces on the sidewalk in downtown Denver, Colorado. It is, it is a horrible place. Years of liberal uh, ideologies in politics have basically turned this multi-billion dollar downtown area that everybody, you know, the convention area of like of these major cities uh, into drug infested wastelands. It's horrible there. But then you deal with the really weird people inside the convention at the MUFON conference. And um, we have run into some very, very interesting people. The, uh, in fact, we were just in Cincinnati at last summer's MUFON convention, because that's where it was. It was, it was right here in Kentucky. And um, we met a lady there that was, um, she, she referred to herself as a former Southern Baptist preacher's wife. Now, she's still married to the man. He was a former Southern Baptist preacher. But she turned, and she turned to her husband. She said she had a near-death experience. She had this entity in this darkness. She said when she died, she didn't see this light. She didn't go through this tunnel. She was down in, in a place that, believe it or not, she called it outer darkness. What does that sound like to you? It's the exact place that Jesus said they would be cast into. Although in her mind, this was a good place. And so she's being led by this dark entity behind her who is showing her, uh, I don't know, I want, to get, I want to get into all the details, but when she comes out of that, she spends a year trying to collect herself and collect her new version of theology, and basically now she is a new ager. She may not call herself that, but that's what it's turned her into, and you're going to see some of this in this presentation. This picture uh, up on the screen, if you have uh, 2 Corinthians 11 open, uh, you know this is the place, if you look in verse... Uh, verse 4, uh, actually verse 3, uh, Paul is warning us not to, not to fall in the same way that Eve fell through Satan's subtlety. And he said, your minds will be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. If you want to know where my heart is, I'm a pastor. I've been, I, I'm a church boy. I grew up in church. I have lived church all my life. I've been a pastor. I, grew, I pastor my home church, the church I grew up in. I've been there for most of my life. I met my wife at that church, Bethel Church in Festus, Missouri. She's back there hiding somewhere. And, um, and uh, I, I, she has been the stability of my life. Anyway, we've been married there. We were married in that church. She went into labor with our first daughter at that church and it's just it, my whole life has been there but my life and my ministry I want to see God's people wake up if you are if if you are listening to me for the first time or you're watching me and you don't believe any of this UFO stuff get out of the 20th century 
It's not, it's not a question anymore of whether this is real. This is real. This is real not just because Congress is having meetings on it and Congress is saying this is real. This represents a threat. They're looking at it from a defense standpoint and they're saying we need, we need the Defense Department to open up its files. We need the CIA files. We need the, uh, uh, the defense uh, agency's files and all of their stuff turned over to Congress like it's supposed to be. I mean, we vote. The congressmen in, we vote the president sometimes. <laughs> yeah. We vote these people in, and they're the ones who are supposed to be in charge of our government, but they're running into non-elected officials who are holding back. They're the gatekeepers of the information on this thing, and they're saying, you're just a congressman. You are not authorized to see this material. That's crazy. That's the country we live in right now. And so Congress is saying this is real. You've got members of Congress that are going absolutely 100%. We have seen the evidence. We know this is real. Uh, the, but the sad thing is when you get into uh, the, the, the churches, when you start talking to, uh, to Christians about it, they say, oh, I don't believe in that stuff or that's, that's not really anything or it doesn't affect me. I don't think it has anything related to Bible prophecy. Well, I'm here to tell you very kindly that you're wrong. And I want to be able to show you from the word of God. This picture up on the screen um, is from an event that took place in Brazil uh, this past year, um, I believe the photograph to be legitimate. There's a lot of photographs. There's a lot of videos out there. Some are legitimate. Some are not. Sometimes the fakes are pretty easy to tell. They just look too good. Uh, but this actually is part of uh, an, uh, an attack that took place in a very, very remote village. These people were shooting at these alien type figures. And somebody took a photograph of this thing. Uh, uh, protruding light from its body. Now, what, what in the world is that? Well, we go back to 2 Corinthians chapter 11, and you look in verse, um, oh, let's see, let's pick it up in verse 13. For such are false apostles. Let me ask you that. Do, do you believe there's false apostles out there? Say amen. Yeah, deceitful workers. Got any of those? Transforming themselves into the apostles of Christ. And the, and the thing is, I love using the internet just not to get our message out. Unfortunately, on the other side there are, the saying, hey, let me way tell you the other part. The good dies. The let me bad tell you the truth. Verse 14, and no marvel. Their false for Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light. Do you know what that would be if we were to name this character, Satan, according to verse 14, the name would be Lucifer. Because Lucis means light, and the ifer part of that means a messenger or a bringer of light. And that is exactly what you'll find in Isaiah chapter 14, verse 12. How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer? He is an angel or a bearer of light. And so look in verse 15. Therefore... It is no great thing if his ministers also be transformed as the ministers of righteousness. Now, do I believe that those ministers, some of those ministers are human agents? Absolutely. Do I also believe that those ministers who are following Satan are spirits, are themselves evil angels? Absolutely. We know from the scriptures that he has one third of the angelic realm on his side, fighting a war that he's not going to win. Amen? Amen. Amen. He's already been defeated 2,000 years ago. He just don't know it. Amen? That's like cutting the head off of a snake and watching the body do this for about 30 minutes. He's dead. He just don't know it yet. Amen? <laughs> Amen. Yeah, I'll come up with all kinds of goodies like that. All right, now, uh, this, this event took place in Las Vegas. Yeah, uh, who remembers that? There's actually some video out there, and you got to be careful. Some of it's fake, some of it's not. They interviewed this guy recently, as recently as I think a few weeks ago. And uh, this is what brought him to mind, because in this interview, he's sitting there, and he's, he is just as afraid now 
as he was when this event took place. He's, and he said, you can believe me if you want to. I don't care. I'm not after uh, fame. I'm not after everybody knowing who I am. I don't care about that. This thing showed up in my backyard. Not even the police wanted anything to do with it. And he said, I'm standing here looking at a 10-foot tall alien. He believed what he saw was real. And I believe that the Bible contains all the answers. If you would t turn to Deuteronomy chapter 18, maybe you'll make some notes in your Bible. Let me run through some things. These are what I call the nine forbidden practices. These are nine things that God specifically said don't do them. And I asked the question one time, God, why, don't, why didn't you want them doing this? Other than the fact that, I mean, they're just, they're witchcraft, it's sorcery, it's things like that, that Christians are not supposed to do. But I believe God always has a love motive for everything that he tells us not to do. Don't you? When God tells us don't commit adultery, obviously there is a love motive behind why God would tell us not to do that. And so God told the Israelites, they're about to go into Canaan land. And he says, in Canaan land, we know there were giants there. We know that there were people. I mean, they were huge. They had their religion. And I don't want you to fall into their practice. So he said, there should not be found among you anyone that maketh his son or his daughter to pass through the fire. That was to Molech. They were offering their own children unto Molech. Aren't you glad that you belong to a religion where God doesn't demand the sacrifice of our son? It's based upon the sacrifice of his son. Amen. Amen. I like that. Woohoo. Amen. Is that a Kentucky version of amen? <laughs> that uses divination. Divination is a way to procure information into your mind that does not come through, through the five senses. Sight, smell, taste, feel, and hearing. It doesn't come those normal five sensory ways. It comes through what would be called a sixth sense. It is information that is put directly into your brain, but not by the Holy Spirit, not by God. What is it that is putting the information into someone who is doing divination? What is, what is controlling the hand of someone who is, has their hand on a planchette and they're waving it over a Ouija board? What is it actually that's moving their hand? Is it the force from Star Wars? Uh, is it some big magical electrical energy that's in the universe, dude? Is it anything like that? What is moving their hand? Devils devils okay and they don't like it when you don't do everything the way they demand don't play with Ouija board young people don't go to somebody's house that has a Ouija board there are spirits in that house amen divination of an observer of times that's astrology what are they looking at they're looking at the stars what does the Bible say the stars are angels this is what I was looking for angels are the stars. Where's the woohoo? Where's that one at? You want me to go to the Bible? Yeah, thank you. I'll go to the Bible. How about Revelation? Turn there. Revelation chapter 6. Turn there. Um, Revelation chapter 6. Verse 12, when I beheld and opened the sixth seal, and lo, there was a great earthquake, and the sun became black as sackcloth of hair, and the moon became as blood. And the stars of heaven fell unto the earth. Now, if those are great big giant balls of burning hot gas, what would happen if even one of them fell to the earth? It would annihilate the earth. What, are the, what is it that's falling here in Revelation 6, 13? The powers of the heaven, the stars. Which, uh, turn to uh, Revelation chapter 12, verse 12. Uh, three, there appeared another wonder in heaven. Behold, a great red dragon. Ha who is that? Satan. Satan, having seven heads and ten horns and seven crowns upon his heads. And his tail drew the third part of the what? Stars of heaven. What did he drag to the earth? Well, we look down in verse uh, seven. And there was a war in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon. And the dragon fought and his angels. Now, here's the neat part. How many angels are there? 
The Bible says that we are surrounded by an innumerable company of angels. The Bible says that there is no way we will ever be able to tell the number of the stars. So they are innumerable, which means that it is a number that literally has no end. It goes on into infinity. Stop and think about that for a minute. Now, once you get to how big the number is, the infinite number of angels, only God can cut off a third of them, right? And what is a third is a decimal. It's point three, three. Y'all sound silly doing that. It never ends, does it? And yet God knows how to cut it off, doesn't he? No matter how many stars and angels there are, God is still the most high of all of them. Amen? So an observer of times, if you are an observer of times, what you're doing is that you are asking those stars to guide your life. Those stars are not the guides of your life. God is. Or an enchanter. An enchanter is someone who chants. They, they re, uh, repeat Prayers. What did Jesus say about repeating prayers over and over? D don't do what the heathen do, for they think they should be heard for their much speaking. So don't keep repeating prayers over and over, or mantras over and over, or words with no meaning, like the word om. When you hear people, uh, they wad their legs up in a knot, and they sit there, and they, and they say the word om, om, om. You know what the Hindus believe that the word om means? It doesn't have one. It is a word with no meaning. I believe in the word that has all the meaning. His name is Jesus Christ. Amen. So you see the opposites here? We follow a word that has meaning. They follow a word that has no meaning. And they recite it over and over again. So still they're dealing with devils. They're dealing with spirits or a witch. We know that witchcraft involves Satanism or a charmer. Someone who uses... Um, different medallions and I'm just gonna say this I don't want to offend anybody don't want to make anybody mad but let me just say that the Catholic Church is a church of medallions they are in church of charmers they are a church of enchanters the monks who did their uh, oh what do they call it uh, where they used to get and they sing the same words over and over again endlessly like a drone yeah okay um, yeah, chant, yeah, chant, I should have said the word chant, yeah, it would have been easier. Uh, but, uh, they, they use medallions, I guarantee if you go to the Vatican, the Vatican is going to be surrounded in Rome with hundreds, maybe even thousands of kiosks and little shops that's going to sell necklaces, bracelets, different kinds of medals that you wear. And supposedly if you wear those medals and you die with those, then you're given uh, so much credit in heaven with, against your sins. It's not the gospel of Jesus Christ, is it? Okay, it's not. And so then you're a consulter with familiar spirits. That is having a direct contact with a devil, which I'm going to focus on that. Or a wizard or a necromancer. Necromancer is someone who contacts what they think is the dead. Now, if you've seen any of my videos, you know I've asked, I'm blessed with strong opinions. <laughs> which means that sometimes people don't like me. Uh, I believe with all my heart that who Saul was speaking to was not Samuel. It was, his, it was a familiar, it looked like Samuel. It sounded like Samuel, but it could not have been Samuel. The text clearly tells us right before that story that God stopped talking to Saul through the prophets. So that's what Samuel was. And so if, if, that, if that was Samuel, then God lied. And God doesn't lie. That's what a necromancer is. Now, uh, we are part of the Star Trek generation. Amen? <laughs> Sci fi? Um, and we, you know, we watched all these. We watched Lost in Space. We watched Star Trek. We watched Star Wars. And we saw that the way to connect or to communicate with an alien race is to get Lieutenant Uhura here uh, to open up a channel. 
and to send out a hailing frequency to the alien ship, and the alien ship was supposed to respond, and they, of course, the only reason, the only way the Klingons responded was by blowing up your ship, okay? So anyway, but that's actually not how people now are in contact with who they think are alien races. This is actually closer. Okay, this is, um, this is getting in contact with a familiar spirit. In Deuteronomy chapter 13, you might want to turn there and make some notes here because all of these are prophecies. These, uh, I believe that all these things were written aforetime for our learning uh, and that they are going to happen again. Uh, Solomon said very wisely in Ecclesiastes chapter 1, um, the thing that hath been is the thing that shall be. There is no new thing under the sun. And so the reason why a lot of these speakers uh, this weekend are going back to the book of Genesis chapter 6 and other places in the Bible uh, for reference on what is happening uh, in these last days is because this Bible is the whole thing is a sure word of prophecy. It is telling us what is going to happen and in fact what is happening now. So God warned Israel. In Deuteronomy 13, if there arise among you a prophet or a dreamer of dreams. Have you ever had a dream? I have. Uh, I was talking to somebody before uh, me coming up here. And they said, I don't know if you believe this or not, but um, I believe that I had a dream. And a, a spirit was in it, like a devil, like an evil spirit or a familiar spirit was in it. I said, absolutely, I believe that. I've had several of them. Okay, and uh, one of them was at was so real and it was so dark uh, to me and it was it was it was so prominent there that when I woke up, um, I asked my wife, she was laying there next to me and I said, was I just talking? She said, yeah. I said, what was I saying? She was uh, she said uh, you were saying, who are you? What are you doing? And that's exactly in my dream what I was saying. I was actually saying the words out loud and didn't didn't realize it. But I believe that they they show up. And so the the dreamer of dreams giveth thee a sign or a wonder. If you are a person given to signs or wonders, I'm not speaking out against signs. Gideon, of course, was a signs guy. He's always had to have God. God show me this. God show me that. God have laid the fleece out. Now I'm going to lay the fleece out again. So there's nothing wrong with that. But don't put. I wouldn't base your doctrine or your salvation on it. I mean, if, you want, if you're having trouble believing you're saved, read the scriptures. Don't ask God for signs. Read Romans 3.23, Romans 6.23, Romans 10.9 and 10, Ephesians 2.8 and 9, 1 John 1, 9. Read, in fact, read the whole book of 1 John. Amen. These things have I written unto you that you may know that you have eternal life. Okay. So watch out for the signs and wonders, people. And he said, if the sign or the wonder come to pass, and see, that's what gets people. Oh, have you seen brother so-and-so? No. Oh, you need to see him because he's shown many signs or wonders. So? But they've all come to pass. Well, most of them have come to pass. I don't care. In this case here, he specifically says if, if they come to pass, whether, whereof he spake unto these saying. And this is what got me. Because I was thinking that this text was going to say, Let's go after another God, because we are monotheistic. But it doesn't say that. Let us go after other what? Gods. If these aliens, and by the way, alien is a wonderful name to call them. It's biblical. An alien is someone who is not from here, and they're not from here. I don't care. It doesn't matter what how you see the alien thing as being, they're definitely not from here, meaning Kentucky, okay? <laughs> California, I'm not so sure about, but they're not, they're not from here, okay? They will tell you that they believe that they are superior to us in every way. That's a God. If there is an entity that can appear and disappear at will, if there's an entity that can actually transmit images and thoughts into your head, if there's an entity that can move things without you seeing it 
uh, be done or whatever. It, no matter what it can do, if it, it can outdo you in everything, then it's a God. Let us go after other gods multiple which thou hast not known, and let us serve them. You know what? Let me keep reading that text, because it's important. So God establishes that there will be signs and wonders. We know that from the book of Joel and from the book of Acts. There will be signs and wonders in the heavens. And in this case here, God said, if they come with signs and wonders, and then they say, let us go after these gods, these other gods, uh, God said in verse 3, you should not hearken unto the words of that prophet or that dreamer of dream. And, and this is what's going on right now. For the Lord your God proveth you. Do you know who's sending these gods, these aliens down to this planet? God is. God is. I saw a look that went. Let me explain myself. Who made Satan? Yeah. What did he make him for? To do exactly what he did in the Garden of Eden. To do exactly what he did the night that Judas betrayed Christ. To do exactly what he's doing now. He's a roaring lion walking about seeking whom he may devour. Is not Satan, as evil as he is, is he not serving the plan of God? Did he not serve the plan of God in the Garden of Eden? Yes. Did he not serve the plan of God at Calvary? Yes. Is he not serving the plan of God now? Because everything that's written in this Bible is going to come to pass. Amen? Does that make sense now? Does God... And in fact, let me give you another verse. It's in uh, Jeremiah 50 or 51. But it says, Babylon hath been a golden cup in the Lord's hand. Babylon's cup is full of the wine of fornication and drunkenness. Do we have a problem with that in this country? Absolutely. Drunkenness, and I'm not just talking about drunkenness as far as wine and alcohol is concerned. I'm talking about drunkenness as far as prescription drugs, marijuana, legal marijuana now. In the state of Missouri, we we voted no, we're not want to, going to do that. And then they turn around, we voted again. Now we want legal marijuana. And now we've got it all over the state. And it's destroying people's lives. So all of these things go together. Well, the Bible says that Babylon has been a golden cup in the Lord's head. God, God is the one who pours out the drunkenness. God is the one to do that. Why? Because if that's all people want is drunkenness, that's all they're going to get. Read Ezekiel chapter 14, where the men came up to the prophet Ezekiel and he said, will you inquire uh, of God for us? And Ezekiel went to God and he said, the, the elders want to hear from you. And God said, I'm not going to answer them, but according to the abundance of idols that is in their heart. And so they've got idols in their heart. They have the stumbling block of their iniquity hidden in their heart. And so I'm only going to answer them according to those idols, which means God says, I'm going to let them believe a lie. Does that sound like a verse out of the New Testament you've heard? Second Thessalonians chapter 2. God uh, shall send. God shall send strong delusion. Who sends it? So back to Deuteronomy 13, God said, for the Lord your God proveth you to know whether ye love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul, and ye shall walk after the Lord your God and fear him and keep his commandments. So God in this room today knows who is and who isn't. I don't know. And maybe the people closest to you don't know. You can fool them into believing that you're a genuine, true, 100% born-again, Bible-believing Christian. But you could be lying. And God knows it. And so you know what God's going to do? Je Remember what Jesus did? He separated the sheep from the goats. And when God separates those sheep from those goats, it's going to be about what they believed, what they did versus what they didn't believe and what they didn't do, so on and so on. 
God is going to pour out evil things onto this earth so that those who are truly born again, they're going to stick with the Word of God. They're going to stick with the blood of Jesus Christ. They're going to stick with those doctrines that our forefathers were burned at the stake believing in. Amen? While the fake and phony Christians are going to jump after all the lies that Babylon has to tell. By the way, I have a picture up here of a movie. Does anybody know what movie it is? Close Encounters of the Third Kind. You know who produced that movie? Who wrote it? Spielberg is a Jew, okay? He is a Christ-hating Jew. And I've picked that up from his movies, okay? Uh, the main character in this movie, if I can walk over here for just a minute. The main character in this movie is a man by the name of Neary, Roy Neary, played by Richard Dreyfuss. Notice, notice he's about ready to go on the, um, the alien ship and go up into heaven. Notice the imagery of his body. Do you know how old he is in the script? Do you know how old he is? 33. Who's, who's been watching my videos? He's 33 years old. And I'll tell you more about that in a minute if I get time. 1 Samuel 28. This is where we get into Saul. And Saul disguised himself and put on other raiment and went, and two men with him. And they came to the woman by night. The woman at, where was she? Where was she from? Endor. Who remembers Bewitched? What was her mother's name? Endora. Yeah. The Jew that wrote, and I'm not saying this in a belligerent way. I love Israel and I'm on their side. Woo! -hoo! Excuse me. My savior was a Jew. Thank you. Yeah. Um, but anyway, and he, he came, this woman was from anyway, I pray the divine, divine unto me. Remember what we said divination was receiving information into your mind that did not come from your five senses or did not come from God. Divine unto me by the familiar spirit. See, that's what Saul is asking for, is a familiar spirit. And bring me him up whom I shall name unto thee. So dividing is information by way of psychic or familiar spirit means. Now, I've read a ton. I've got a ton of books on UFOs. I've been reading these since I was a child in school. It's always fascinated me, but I grew up a good church boy. So I thought, well, the two have to match. And so throughout my life, I've always just wondered at how God's word would reveal exactly what this whole UFO thing was all about. There is a, uh, a famous author by the name of Jacques Vallée. In fact, the scene that we just saw from Close Encounters, uh, the man that you see standing here, uh, the, he plays a French UFO expert, and he is, his character is based upon uh, Jacques Vallée. Well, here's what Vallée said in a book that he wrote called UFOs, The Psychic Solution. He said, a number of witnesses, for example, reported perceiving, perceiving. You know, that's the exact word in the King James where when Saul thought he was looking at Samuel, he said, Saul perceived. See, a perception is something that takes place in the mind. And he said, they are perceiving distinct messages inside their heads. A fact they interpreted as an indication of a telepathic ability on the part of the UFO occupants. So Valet is saying that according to the people who claim to have been on these ships taken out of their bed at night, uh, somehow, some way transported through the walls of their house, they can actually feel the wall moving through their body. They said it was a weird feeling and going up into this ship. They're actually saying that when the aliens communicated with them, it was not done by language. It was done by planting thoughts inside their head. In Job chapter 4, this is, uh, I told the guy that uh, said that he had a dream and he believed that he had a spirit in his dream. If you turn to Job chapter 4, or you'll write this down and look at it later. If you look at verse 12, uh, Job's friend, who is this? Eliphaz the Temanite, he said, now a thing was secretly brought to me, and mine ear received a little thereof. 
Notice this. That he's going to now give the how it happened. He said it happened in thoughts from the visions of the night when deep sleep falleth upon men. He is saying, I was sound asleep. And these thoughts were planted into my brain while I was asleep. And he said, fear came upon me and trembling, which made all my bones to shake. Then a spirit passed before my face. The hair of my flesh stood up. He is describing an evil spirit passing before him while he's in a dream state, while he is asleep at night. And so he is having this. So let me just ask you a simple question. Do you believe that spirits, evil spirits, have access to the thoughts of our mind? Of course they do. They are deceivers, aren't they? They are tempters. They're the ones that draw our attention to something that's evil. Now, I believe that God's angels have the same power. How many, how many of you have had your head turned to look at something literally at just the right time and, and it may have saved your life or may have let you save somebody else's life or something like that. And it was a good thing. Have you ever had that happen before? I have. Yes, I have. It was in the form of a car I hit. That was, I was asleep in the, behind the wheel and I hit a car in front of me. <laughs> it saved our life. But anyway, it really happens. Now, in this movie, Close Encounters, Jack Vallée's character in this movie mentions the psychic connection. This scene here is where Roy Neary, he, is, he works for the electric company in Indiana, and he is on his way to try to repair what's going on. All the lights are out everywhere. And this UFO comes over his truck, and it transmits things into his mind. What it transmitted into his mind was the image of a mountain. Now, uh, let me give you this idea. Uh, Spielberg is a Jew, so he would have known about the story of Moses and the Exodus and Moses leading God's people to Mount Sinai, right? And so Moses is the man who leads 12 tribes to the mountain of God and there at the mountain of God to receive the glorious law of God. Their salvation is their covenant with God, okay? In this movie, Spielberg turns it around. And he says, I'm not going to have 12 tribes. I'm going to have 12 people. And it, there were exactly 12 people that showed up that had this image planted in their mind of this mountain. Remember Spielberg in the, uh, no, or, or Neary in this movie, he's playing with mashed potatoes, He's playing with shaving cream, and he can't figure it out until one morning he's got this mountain made out of clay, and he rips the top off, and he goes, that's it. And then he sees on TV once he's built this big 10-foot version of it in his living room, and he looks on TV, and all of a sudden he sees that the, the government has cleared out the area around what place? It wasn't the mountain of God, was it? It's the exact opposite. It was Devil's Tower, Wyoming. And these aliens brought 12 people to Devil's Tower because they were supposed to, all 12 of those people were supposed to go up into the mothership. Now, I'm going to share this just for a little bit. I'm not sure if it's real or not, okay? But supposedly there was a government operation called Project Serpo. Write that down. Serpo. Be careful what you believe about it. Because like I said, I can't say it's true. Supposedly the government of this country, or the secret government, had selected 12 people to take a ride to an alien planet called Serpo. This was done on behalf of the aliens from that planet. And they, of course, were going to leave one or two of their guys here. And uh, so Spielberg knew of that. And in this movie, you don't, it's never mentioned. You have to watch the movie like 300 times to really get this out of it. But there's always these 12 people in, their, in these uh, sort, of, sort of dark orange jumpsuits. And they have an emblem on their, on their uh, arm. And it says uh, Project Mayflower. 
What was the Mayflower that, that brought what? The Christian pilgrims to the promised land. Dun, dun, dun. Okay? That's what, they, that's what he named it in the movie, Project Mayflower. These 12 government people were the ones who were supposed to go up into the ship. But the aliens had a different thing in mind. They had picked 12 people that they wanted. And, of course, the only person who actually made it there was this character, Neri, who was 33, who goes up into the ship like this. And he disappears forever. He goes up into heaven. So anyway, but it's mentioned in this movie that they all received, quote, the psychic connection. Now, if there was ever a case, if there was ever a case uh, that I think would convince any reasonable thinking person, rational thinking, it would be this right here, the aerial school in uh, Zimbabwe. This happened uh, September 16, 1994. There were about 100 students at this elementary school. It was a mixed race school. You had whites and blacks. They all spoke very good English. And um, the teachers were having a meeting with the headmaster. And so there were some other workers there that were watching the children out on the playground. During this time, 62, 62 of the children reported the landing of a silvery disc just, out, just outside of the playground. Some of them ran in fear, while others watched as three, quote-unquote, aliens. And you have to understand, this is 1994. The imagery of what, a, what we call a gray alien, what it would look like, had just been brought out into popular culture here in America by way of Whitley Strieber's book, Communion, because he had this gray alien character painted on the front of his book, Communion, and if you know anything about Whitley Strieber, you'll know that that alien that was on the cover of his book was a female alien. And according to Strieber, he had had several romantic interludes with her and was proud to talk to his wife about it. She was right there with him on all this alien stuff. But anyway, so then all of a sudden, people started coming out of the woodwork. I've seen this. I've seen this. I've been taken in these ships, and I've seen that exact thing. Now, so now we're in Zimbabwe. They're not influenced by American culture at that time. There is no Internet to just put things around the world at that time. So they had no idea what a gray, quote-unquote, alien looked like. But they all described the same thing. They had dark jumpsuits. They appeared and seemed to float just across the ground like this. Several students, get this now, who made eye contact with the beings reported a downloading of images and visions of the destruction of the earth, burning of the forest, blamed on man's flirting with technology. The African students believed that the beings were called tokoloshes. When I brought this up, my son-in-law is from Nairobi, Kenya. And, um, and so I mentioned to him and my daughter a tokolosh, and they said, yeah, that's what uh, a lot of Africans refer to as devils out there, or what we would call elves or dwarves or anything like that out of, out of our own Western culture going back into Europe and England. They called them tokoloshes, which is a type of an African devil. And they all, when uh, Dr. John Mack who was uh, Harvard, in fact, he was the Harvard psychiatrist. He was the head of the psychiatric department at Harvard University. And um, he decided to go out there with a camera crew. And he interviewed these children that would be on camera and whose parents allowed them to be interviewed. Because these parents wanted to know if they were lying or not. And he interviewed them. He had them all draw pictures of the craft. He had them draw pictures of what they saw, the aliens coming out of it. They all drew pretty much the same picture of the craft. They all drew pretty much the same picture of the aliens. And to this day, there is a, a, um, a documentary out now called um, Aerial Phenomenon, and they have interviewed several of these uh, children who are now grown adults now, and they all stick into their story. They said, we know what we saw. You don't believe us, you don't have to, but we know what we saw. What we saw was true. What we told was true. Our own parents didn't want to believe us. Our teachers, some of them admonished us 
for making up fabrications. But Dr. Mack is saying, you don't get 62 kids to, sell, to tell the same lie over the course of several months, much less over the course of 20 to 30 years later. Now, uh, with what time I have left, let me introduce you to Dr. Stephen Greer. If there was a John the Baptist for Jesus, there is a John the Baptist for the aliens, and this guy seems to be it. He's the leader of the Disclosure Project. He's developed an additional close encounter level called Close Encounter of the Fifth Kind, Human Initiated Contact. And so what he basically, I want to run through this very quickly, what he basically does, he tells them to, to close their eyes, to chant mantras, to be enchanters, to get in contact with familiar spirits that he believes are aliens. He's been doing this since he was in college. He is an ER physician, by the way, who left uh, all of that to basically chase UFOs. And... Um, let me just read a couple of things that he said. I'm going to show you a picture of something that's in your Bible. If you want to turn to Numbers 21, go ahead, and I'll try to hurry to get there. Here's what Greer said. He's got a free book on his website called Hidden Truth, Forbidden Knowledge. And he said that it was a near-death experience, finding himself suddenly released from my body. I was carried into the depths of space where I already felt at home. Then I experienced what I now understand to be, a, to be God consciousness. He believes that he attained the mind of God. Where my individuality became faint as it merged with the effulgent, unbounded, pure, infinite, and he capitalized the word mind. There was no duality. It lasted for what seemed to be an eternity because a normal sense of time disappears. In that state of being, I could see all of creation, the vastness of the cosmos, and it was beautiful beyond words. There was nothing frightening about it, only infinite awareness, joy, and the perception of an endless, perfect creation. As I said, that's from his book. He later on describes that he entered a state of oneness with them, and he says, I have no sense of how long this, notice he uses the phrase, union with. Let me ask you good Christians, is it possible to be one with God outside of the mediator, Jesus Christ? There is only one God and one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus, thank you for saying scripture with me. He said perfect oneness of unbounded mind and creation as one. He says he fell back. The conscious mind we are awake with at this moment is the same as that of the divine being of all beings. And yet Isaiah 55 says of our God, for my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, saith the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways and my thoughts higher than your thoughts. While Stephen Greer wants to have everybody believe that he had a oneness with the mind of God, God said, you have no clue. Amen. Take a look at this. Dr. Greer uh, how much time do I have? I'm over. <laughs> Dr. Greer uh, taught a group how to get in touch with E.T. Generally, when uh, these groups get together, almost without fail, they will capture uh, UFOs up in the night sky with uh, um, infrared cameras and so on, um, or out at the beach. Sometimes uh, there's video of, of these uh, amber orbs showing up out over the ocean as these people meditate and get in touch with the, the familiar spirits that they are. My idea of aliens is that they are devils. They are devils. They are of the, they are of the angelic realm of the one-third of the evil angels that uh, have fallen uh, with Satan and they are here to deceive this earth. They're here to deceive only those who want to be deceived. So while these people, there's about 15 or 20, no more than that, in these groups, while they're meditating, while they're chanting, while they're doing their mantraing and, and so on and so on, all of a sudden now, 
the camera clicks, and when they look at the digital image, they see that there is what looks like a very white, bright, illuminated serpent. Did you turn to Numbers 21? Tell me what story is in verse 6 of Numbers 21. What story is there? It's when the Israelites complained against God. They didn't want the manna. You know what the manna is? It's Christ. It's the bread of life, isn't it? It's the bread that came from heaven. Jesus said, I'm the bread that came. They rejected that bread. So what did God do? Sent, not just serpents, fiery serpents. In fact, here's close up. The Lord sent fiery serpents among the... Now, who sent the serpents? God did, didn't he? You see what God's doing now? God is deceiving those who want to be deceived. And it's interesting that this serpent, its head landed right here. What is this spot in Bible prophecy? It's where the mark of the beast goes. Everybody knows that. In Hindu religion, it is called kundalini. Now, that's not made with pasta and tomato sauce, okay? It is the idea that you have at the base of your spine a coiled up serpent. And that you, through meditation and through the mantras of Om or whatever it is, that you can make this serpent arise. How many bones you have in your spine 33 yeah 33 bones of your spine to touch your pineal gland or the spot right here on your forehead forehead exactly where this serpent landed okay and let me just throw this in about your spine you know what your spine looks like upside down let me just give you a little physiology here this is where your brain would be. Your brain, through your spinal cord, has, sends out nerve endings on both sides of each, each one of these bones to speak to your body. The last four, the bottom four, which is called the sacrum. It is called the sacrum because it's referred to as the sacred place, which is actually, if I can be just a little bit crude, your butt. Okay, and they say that's where the devil is. Yeah. But those last four uh, parts of your spine, there's no nerves coming out of them at all. There's no communication from the head to that part of your body. You think about that in theological terms. Who's the head? Christ. Who's the body? We are. How do, I'm going to give you this and I'm going to quit. How does the head, Jesus, communicate with the body? You have 33 bones. Four of them are left out. And just very quickly, you have four different ones that come directly down from your brain into your body. One, two of those is the vagus nerve. Anybody knows anything about the vagus nerve? Then you know what I'm talking about. It comes directly down from your brain. So four of those come from your brain where the other four can't connect to the body. So if you have 33 nerves coming down, one going to the left, one going to the right, 33 times two is what? How does the head speak to the body? 66 books of the Bible. Somebody say amen. Father, bless your word today. Bless these people. Lord, it's been a joy to speak to them. I pray, dear God, Lord, that each one of them would wish further to live their life for you, to live your, their life as an example, what Christ can do with sinners. And Father, may we always, always draw praise to you and to your wonderful word. We pray this in Jesus' name. And all of God's people said, amen. God bless you.